there was, was said earlier on, some of us feel we've been around the block on this a, a few times, um, you know, with various sort of a, agreements at different points. And, you know, as, as John was saying, the, one of the great things, at least with that, is, you, you know, you know things can be defeated. On the other hand, it becomes like this sort of hydra that you think you've defeated it, and then, you know, a head appears somewhere else and off you go again. It's there under a different sort of different guise. And that's certainly true with the investments um, part of it. You, you know, the, having sort of thoughts that we dispose of it with the multilateral agreement, you know, there on investments, lo and behold, we get it back, Singapore round, WTO, etc., etc. And so it, it is this thing about, you know, eternal vigilance. And the, the negotiations on this um, particular uh, trade agreement now have been going on since about sort of July, August last year, the formal ones, once the, the sort of the go ahead was given at European Union level, and I'll say something about that in a minute. So, if they're successful, if they're successful, they cover more than about 40% of current global GDP. So this is big, this is a big chunk um, the, you know, of trade and, and so on in the, moment, in the world at the moment, and foreign direct investment as well. So that's, in trade and trade of goods at the moment is worth about um, 2 billion euro. One of the things talking about this, you have to look whether it's euro, dollars, pounds, you know, down. It's a lot. So, and it's also reckoned that and what we're told is it will be the biggest trade deal ever negotiated. And the plus side of it that we're always being told is that it's going to result in millions of euros of savings for companies and it's going to create hundreds of thousands of jobs. Okay, uh, that's you know what people will claim. And we've also been hearing about, you know, what good value it's supposed to be for each household per year. But yes, we've heard the maths. <laughs> so the first round of negotiations, the first sort of discussions were taking place in July, August last year in the US. And they covered market access for agricultural and industrial goods, government procurement, investment, energy and raw materials, regulatory issues, sanitary, phytosanitary measures, services, intellectual property rights, sustainable development, I'm not quite sure how that got in there, but sustainable development, probably how to get rid of it, um, small and medium sized enterprises, dispute settlement, competition, customs and trade facilitation, and state owned enterprises. I hope everybody's got that. There's a test at the end. Um, you know, and certainly, there's also been said that it's the EU that's pushing for the financial services in there. And this is something as well that they were putting in the W World Trade Organization round, the Doha round, is one of the reasons why that round failed. The agricultural side of it has been also being pushed there, and that's another of the reasons. So you can see two of these really big industries which were part of the problem in reaching an agreement on a multilateral agreement on trade. Doha now coming back in another way in bilateral trade agreements. And there's certainly a view that because of the failure of that multilateral trade record, that's why we've also been seeing a rapid increase in the number of bilateral agreements. That countries thinking, okay, you know, if we can't do it, all of us sitting around the table, well, you know, we'll be selective. And it's a variety of things. This one, I think, is different in a sense for the European Union because a lot of the trade deals that have been going on, one of the big arguments that's been made against them is that they have not actually been trade agreements between equals. It's been between the EU and countries which have much less economic clout, much less, um, you know, sort of in terms of resources, negotiating resources or whatever. This one is seen as the really big one and at least is being seen as something in between equals. So we've been hearing about why we should be worrying about it. And the lack of transparency, to put it mildly, is enormous. And I know that, you know, 
a lot of us would argue that maybe certain occasions you want a degree of confidentiality, you don't necessarily want your pay negotiation <laughs> strategy sort of out there, you know, for your boss to see before you go in and ask. But on the other hand, this is something which is going to affect the daily life of many millions of people. It's going to affect the possibility to make decisions about the daily lives of people. So the issues about transparency within this are absolutely crucial. And what we're hearing is that even some of the national governments in the European Union are not really having full access to what the United States is so, you know, there's a whole sort of, it's almost a belief system built up on this. That this is going to be good, and therefore we don't have to ask too many questions because we've already agreed we want an outcome um, at the end of the day. And even if you hear the Commission, European Commission at times talking about the consultations and so on that it did, before it actually sort of was discussing, while it was discussing what mandate it had for negotiations, because it's a commission that does the negotiating. A lot of the um, stakeholder meetings and so on that they will tell you that they had, I think the estimate is that something like 97% of those meetings, or people involved in those meetings, were basically from the big companies. So you begin to see, you know, what's the expertise that's being drawn on, Whose agenda is it that then is then being brought to the table? And I think it's absolutely clear. So we go from the process within this is that the mandate that the Commission is negotiating on with has been signed off by the national governments, what's called council, which is the representatives of the 28 governments currently. And they give this to the Commission and they say, okay. This is what we were prepared to put on the table. This is what we want. This, if you like, is the scope of your mandate. And I think it's worth remembering that because this is while the Commission is doing the negotiating, there were governments sitting at the table to decide what would go into that negotiating package and get it started. So when we're looking at the, um, all the issues about investor state dispute settlement, a lot of these agreements already exist. We've heard the UK already has a lot of these agreements. A lot of other countries do. And it is environmental social goals that are often hit by them. At the moment, Vattenfall's Swedish company is suing the German federal government for about 3 billion euros because the German government decided it was going to go for renewable energies, not nuclear. And Vattenfall is saying, well, okay, um, this is what you owe us because you're phasing out nuclear. And, okay, you know, I think all of us would say if you're making big changes that affect an industry, you should be taking care of it, you're doing that responsibly. Normally we mean in terms of the workers yeah. and their future. This is all about the companies. We're now hearing that Germany is having second thoughts about the inclusion of the state dispute settlement within this some strange reason, I can't imagine why. <laughs> we think that France is maybe beginning to have a second thought. So I think it's really interesting to see how many governments we can get to really reconsider what it is they are signing up to here, and why it is they are effectively signing away any semblance of democracy left for their countries. The regulations and the standards, we've heard, affect everybody. A lot of it about food standards, we're beginning to see a chilling effect already on certain of the things that the European Union once stood for, and a feeling that this is now lining up, getting us ready for when we have these sort of further negotiations. The only European Parliament was being asked to sort of put its forward its view on the, um, the trade, trade agreement. We're allowed to have an opinion, it's not necessarily allowed to count for it. At the end of the day, we can say yes or no. Um, but certainly the Environment Committee in the European Parliament pulled out that some of the key issues that they were concerned about was GMOs, <coughs> modified organisms, chemicals, the poultry pathogen reduction treatments, and aviation greenhouse gas emissions. If you're really trying to deal with those as part of your climate strategy. 
And there is this very big concern, you know, that we're coming at it from different directions. And this has been part of the issue with, with why the European Union at certain points has not had an outright ban on GMOs, because the World Trade Organization, there was a challenge from the states within that, and now you have to find a way around the rules that doesn't ban these things totally. It leaves a little door open, and at the moment, there are quite a few of us still trying to lean on this door to stop it opening any further. But once we're inside this agreement, we really think that, you know, well, we changed a very solid wooden door to a paper one. The Regulatory Cooperation Council, which has also been mentioned, is another big concern. And it's a big concern in terms of who is going to be sitting on that council, whose advice is going to be sought. Is it going to be elected representatives, civil society? Or are people actually going to be talking to the companies again about what are the different difficulties, dear companies, that you have and therefore things that you would like to see as either mutually recognised or find a harmonised standard? And the mutual recognition, in many respects, is as bad as lower, as lower standards. There's also an issue here as well, I think, about not only what it's doing in the US and within the European Union, but there are also arguments about what it does for some of the world's developing nations. And the estimates there, if we're talking about figures, are that countries in North Africa, for example, and you can't exactly say that they have robust economies at the moment, and they have quite a heavy reliance on exports to the EU are set to see a drop in real income per capita of anything between about 3 and 4 percent. And if you don't have a lot in the first place, 3 or 4 percent makes a big difference. And also that, you know, we can see effects potentially on other countries such as Mexico, where the estimates there are their border trade with the states likely to drop by 7 percent. So it isn't just what it's doing between the two blue blocks, it's what it's also doing to other countries that also have trade relationships. And indeed as well, and I think this is something the EU hasn't really thought about too much, is the effect on internal trade within the European Union. Where if you want to look at some of the estimates there, you know, Bertelsmann is talking about potential 40% drop in trade between some of the EU member states. So for all of the talk about the increase of trade with the United States, assuming it happened, assuming you wanted to, all of the benefits, etc., in jobs there, what it actually does within the European Union itself, I think has been really totally underestimated. So the negotiations are going on at the moment. There are those that really want to try and speed them up as rapidly as possible. Francois Hollande is one of them. I think he's desperate for even his 0.5%, you know, in this coming year, take whatever he can get. Who are saying that not so long ago in Washington, we have everything to gain from going quickly. Otherwise, we know there would be a pile-up of fears, of threats, of anxiety. Dead right. <laughs> yeah. So therefore, I think the aim is to slow this down as much as possible. So that, I mean, I don't think it's fears, threats, anxiety. I think it's a bit of truth and some real hard-headed sort of realism coming into this. The Commission has been pushed into a position where, incredibly unusually, it now has what it calls its advisory commission made up of people from business, civil society, social partners, and so on. They're not quite sure what their job is yet. They're not quite sure what materials they'll have access to. But nevertheless, at least they exist. The European Public Health Alliance is represented in that commission. And I think that that in itself is quite indicative of the nervousness of the commission about people's feeling about putting <coughs> even the, the, the breadth of this touching health potentially. So that exists. It's one way of you know, raising voices. But the European Parliament itself has, most unusually, put in place um, a working group within the Trade Committee to actually keep an eye on the negotiations, to have access to as many documents as possible, quite often you know, in a small room, no paper, no pen, taking Google Glasses with you, um, you know, to just maybe to see something and see what you can remember afterwards. But at least the Parliament has done that. I'm not, I can't think of another trade agreement where it's actually set up its own internal commission. There will be 
internal working group. There's a question of whether that carries over, of course, in the new parliament. And then one of the things that is coming up there, of course, is that we have the new commission coming in. With the new parliament, you get a new commission. We have a hearings from the parliamentary committees from the commission, with the commission. I think it's going to be really important on this that those new commissioners are actually questioned, particularly those on industry, on trade, on the financial side of things, about what is it they feel, you know, can be done about this particular what are their views? What is it they're planning to do in terms of whether it's opening it up, in terms of wider discussion, in terms of reviewing, rethinking, um, whether they think this is a good idea, so that from the very, very beginning there is a whole educational process going on there. And I also think it's essential that when the new parliament is coming in at the European level, that there is a whole educational process that goes on there with those new people. It could be at 50, it's usually about 50% new in the European parliament, this time it could be 70% new. So that's people coming in who probably have never heard of this, got no idea what's going on, have no idea why it matters. So as well as having a job to do at the national level in education, I think there's also going to be a very big job to be done at the European level. Because this really is an extremely dangerous agreement as it currently stands because of all of that's in it and because of this whole way in which it actually let, takes away real layers of potential decision making and just hands them over to corporations. So, you know, when you're looking at businessmen who want to be in Parliament, you know, you really think, well, maybe it's time that those of us that are interested in politics went into business. <laughs> One of the questions on climate change, yes, I think it does make it more difficult, um, partly because it, you, know, you have companies who are able to challenge government policy um, on energy. We're hearing about fracking, emissions trading, um, questions about shifting your, your energy use. So there's a whole range of things which potentially become open to challenge. And so that makes that concerted action much more difficult. But one of the things that will be happening, is supposed to be happening over the next few months, is the next stage of the sort of Kyoto, post-Kyoto agreement about what does the world do in terms of its climate change negotiations and agreements. That's supposed to be happening in Paris next year, um, 2015. So it becomes a tension again, between what's the issue, the problem we really need to solve, which in my view is much more about climate than it is in providing ourselves with enough money for potentially a cup of coffee, um, you know, over the next few years. So I think it, it becomes very serious in, in that respect. That there was also a question raised about how this plays um, with, well, my colleague, I suppose, Nigel Farage. Um, and it's been quite interesting to watch because there was a time when UKIP would say, we want out of the European Union, we want international. You know, the, I've been on public platforms with them where they've argued that. And I've said to them, well, if you're interested about sovereignty, the last thing you want to do is join NAFTA because then you're giving away any sort of power you have as a government because you've actually handed it over to companies. And it's exactly the same thing here. And so what we're now hearing, for I said it the other day, was, well, we need to make sure this is all more transparent, but I'm not against trade agreements. And that's where we're at at the moment. So that's a question to ask in any hustings that you're at in the next um, few days. And in terms of the BBC being under threat, um, well, it, it seems to me that if this doesn't, government doesn't get them um, to petite, it potentially does, unless they're exempted. I mean, under the WTO, they were exempted. One of the six things I think. Um, our government didn't put it on the table for WTO. So, you, you know, yes, they're under threat, and I think a lot of organisations are. And the issue here is exactly as was said earlier on, is that governments here can make a decision. They can open up the health service, they can open it up to competition, which exactly, is exactly what this government has done. Once you're inside 
TTIP, certainly as it currently stands, you are not going back on that. And this is the difficulty. It entrenches you. Know, all of that, there's no going back.